The other aspect with, with uh, high resolution continuum source instrumentation is the ability to look once again at elements that are not amenable to classic atomic absorption. These being elements such as phosphorus, sulfur, the halogens, nitrogen. Uh, and by looking at molecular forms, much like Rick Russo did with LIBS, you have a, an instrument capable of isolating the rotational vibrational structure of these molecules for example, phosphorus oxide or sulfur oxide, or a magnesium chloride or magnesium bromide by adding a metal to the sample to form a, a molecule. You can look at the absorption by the molecule. And in this respect, detection limits below 100 picograms absolute have been achieved for the halogens and in the range of one to two nanograms for phosphorus and sulfur. The next big thing that came along, of course, in the mid-1970s was inductively coupled plasma, working in the emission mode. This was a truly versatile multi-element technique, looking at about 70 elements of the periodic table. It arose from work that was done pr principally by um, Velmer Fassel in the United States and um, Stan Greenfield in the United Kingdom. It has high throughput. Fewer interferences than flame atomic absorption because it's a very intense source. It provided limits of detection that were intermediate between the flame and inductively coupled plasma mass spec. Long linear dynamic ranges capable of high precision for multiple analysis. It's based on high resolution spectrometers today, much like I showed you for uh, the continuum source atomic absorption unit. It's readily interfaced to various sample introduction systems. The most recent applications or recent developments in this area, since it's been around since 1974, have been the introduction by Agilent of both a radial and axial view simultaneously achievable. Typically, axial view is done by looking at the emission uh, in, sorry, radial view is done by looking at the emission out the side of the ICP at some distance above this load coil. You obviously have some certain detection limit that way. Another way of looking at or interrogating this plasma is in an axial view. You look down the axis or the throat of the ICP, and you can imagine the path length for emission is much greater here. In fact, it's about 10 times greater. And so the limit of detection in an axial view mode is about 10 times the limit of detection in the radial view, but there are a few more interferences to, uh, that are encountered in the axial view. The other uh, recent um, advance in ICP AES is the introduction of a, a, a nitrogen microwave magnetically powered plasma. And Professor Nebrega has had an opportunity to investigate this system. Again, it provides a performance probably somewhere between an ICP OES and a flame AAS. But the advantage is it doesn't run on argon. And in a country such as Brazil, where I have recently found out that a tank of argon is extremely expensive, when you can generate the nitrogen for this machine in the laboratory through a membrane separator, the cost of operation decreases significantly. What else can we do with modern ICP OES systems? Michael Crackler has demonstrated in this presentation here that again, we can look with high resolution at the separation of isotopic signatures. And in this case here, there's not very many that can be done this way, but in this case here, he looked at uranium. And we see baseline, almost baseline resolved signatures for uranium 233, 35, and 38. And if this had been enriched in 236, the signal would have been right here. So it's good for rapid screening, no matrix separation. It provides information on potential enrichment of uranium samples. And it gives fit for purpose results. Precision on the order of 1% at 100 ppm concentration. And a small bias um, as opposed to what the real numbers are. Other possibilities for, for such measurements include lead, mercury, silver, and copper, but we haven't seen any publications in that area yet. Let's now focus on inorganic mass spectrometry utilizing the ICPMS. And so basically all my subsequent comments from now on are, are going to be related to ICPMS. It by far is the most powerful inorganic analytical instrumental technique that we have available to us. Fortunately, it has become widely available and it's competitively priced. It's not much more costly now than an ICP OES instrument. It offers the same multi-element capability, even more. Relatively simple spectra. 
When you think that there may be only 300 isotopes in the periodic table, where there are hundreds of thousands of emission lines from these 110 elements, um, the chances of having an interference are much less in an ICP MS system. The other advantage is that it's atmospheric pressure sampling as opposed to the classic thermal ionization mass spectrometry used for inorganic analysis. It accepts a wide range of sample formats. You can introduce a gas, a liquid, or a slurry into this ICPMS, or even a solid in the form of a laser ablated aerosol. It's readily hyphen hyphenated with other multidimensional um, uh, techniques such as GC and LC to provide speciation information. Uh, but by far, its importance is lying in the, in the area of isotope ratio techniques. Isotope dilution used for very high accuracy, very high precision analyses. This is a timeline for milestones in the development of ICP-MS. As we uh, mentioned before, I think, it was introduced uh, around 1980. A seminal paper by Sam Houck at Ames, Iowa, working with Velmer Fassel and actually with Alan Gray. Alan Gray had recently five years earlier introduced the paper in 1975 based on the use of an, of an atmospheric pressure inorganic mass spectrometer coupled with a, uh, a similar source to the ICP where he'd already published that. But um, all, of the, um, all of the glory right now goes to Sam in his 1980 paper, rightly so. It was only three years later that a commercial instrument became available in 1983. This was a quadrupole based instrument. Five years after that, a high-resolution sector field instrument, then a multi-collector sector field a few years later, a time-of-flight mass spectrometer, dynamic reaction cell and collision cell spectrometers in uh, 10 or 15 years later, a, uh, a mass cytometer based on time-of-flight introduced in 2009, a truly simultaneous multi-element, multi-collector system introduced in 2010 based on a Matog-Herzog geometry, and a triple quadrupole MS-MS instrument introduced as recently as 2012. And apart from these commercial introductions, we have a good deal of work underway in university laboratories. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, some of these being, uh, and I'll bring your attention to them later, dual source time of flight, a distance of flight cell, and some work on an Orbi trap. I won't specifically say anything other than Dave Copenell at the Pacific Northwest Laboratory has coupled probably 10 years ago, but has not done work since, an ICP to an Orbi trap, which is a high resolution, typically organic mass spectrometer. And he demonstrated a resolution of 150,000, which could, of course, resolve many isobaric interferences. Along the way, mixed, couple, mixed gas plasmas, such as nitrogen and hydrogen, cool plasmas, collision cells, multipoles, octopoles, et cetera, have been experimented with and become commercially available. The objective behind all of these has always been to improve the limits of detection, to reduce interferences or bring them under better control, and to improve isotope ratio precision. So if we have a look at some of these timelines, obviously this was truly a revolutionary advance in inorganic chemistry, inorganic analysis, the introduction of the inductively coupled argon plasma. Sam Houck's initial Detection limits were a few to tens of PPBs. And as I mentioned here, Gray had published five years earlier uh, on his version of, of, of the atmospheric pressure uh, plasma, but he used a DC capillary arc. And so the degrees of ionization were much higher in this system, but it did not have the control that the argon plasma had. So the argon plasma wins out, of course, and everything else is history. We begin with a further evolution of the device in terms of producing a sector field for enhanced resolution to remove interferences. Here you see uh, a typical isobaric interference of a very common molecule in the argon plasma, argon oxide. That is a mass of 56, typically, and that interferes with the major isotope of iron, 56. How do we resolve that? We resolve it by brute force using a high resolution instrument set at 3000. You now can separate iron from argon oxide. Well, this is an evolutionary process. But equally important, with a high resolution instrument operated in low resolution mode, you can get flat topped peaks. And that means any little instability in the magnet still keeps you on the peak. 
and that allows you to do very high precision isotope ratio measurements. Moreover, the sensitivity of these devices because of the enhanced transmission efficiency and very low vacuum uh, increased the sensitivity by two to three orders of magnitude over a quadrupole based device. Very low background because the detector is not in line with the, with the axis of the, spec of the ICP, but rather it goes through these two sector fields. And so the limits of detection are improved a hundredfold. Further improvements in the isotope ratio precision were achieved by using this sector field device, but combining it with a TIMS type multi-collector geometry. So here, multiple Faraday detectors or multiple electron multipliers could be, could be used to simultaneously measure uh, uh, several isotopes. Unfortunately, we can't measure them all with this device. Uh, with thermo, typically seven can be measured at a time, but with the big new instrument, it's called the new 1700, uh, there's 17 Faraday detectors. So you can measure 17 um, isotopes at a time. For isotope ratio precision, on the order of 10 parts per million. Tremendously, tremendously improved. With a desire to improve not only the isotope precision, isotope ratio precision, but more to improve the throughput of uh, samples in the laboratory because more and more analyses were being done with ICPMS, we needed to speed up the process. People started to turn to a consideration of time of flight. Time of flight methodology has been around since the 1950s in the organic sector, but only in the 1980s and 90s, starting with Mike Gilhouse in Australia and a very prolific person that all of you know, Gary Hefia in Bloomington, Indiana, designed, constructed, and demonstrated the performance of time of flight ICPMS. It provides for multiple isotope acquisition, multiple application of internal standards, basically unlimited number, multiple isotope dilution calibration, and importantly, transient signal detection, because up to 30,000 spectra per second could theoretically be measured with these instruments. Now in practice, 30,000 is very high, and most often you'd be measuring noise, so a practical consideration, 100 spectra per second, typically, you'd be able to monitor a, a nice chromatogram, for example. Um, TOF machines were produced by GBC and LECO. LECO abandoned theirs. GBC continued to push them. GBC's was based on an orthogonal acceleration pulse. So the plasma is sampled through the ion optics into this chamber here. An orthogonal voltage pulse is, pushes all the ions out simultaneously into this field-free region where they drift, and they drift in relation to their uh, velocity because this accelerator here gives them all the same kinetic energy and so the fast ones move faster through this uh, the small rather the small ones move faster through the system and the big ones move more slowly through the system even though they have the same kinetic energy velocity is one half mv squared of course so big m means small v then they arrive at a, de at a detector and they arrive sequentially at the detector the small the light elements first followed by the heavy elements so there's tremendous demands on the ability of this detector to resolve in time the sequential arrival of these ions. And you, see, you need nanosecond resolution. These instruments had background count rates of about one count per second, lower than a quadrupole, but the sensitivity was about tenfold poorer than a quadrupole. Fortunately, these combined to give limits of detection equal to a quadrupole. But the isotope ratio was precision is better than a quadrupole. Uh, because of the near simultaneous nature of the detection. Trying to answer the problem of simultaneous detection with fast throughput, Gary once again looked back at the various um, geometries of mass spectrometers, and he found the matoc herzog geometry. This is a relatively complex, uh, a, very, a relatively, uh, con I'm trying to say, uh, a very small instrument, I've forgotten the word, uh, 80 centimeters in length, and it is a sector field instrument. So the ions come in and they bend around here through these two sectors, and they fall on a single plane, a single focal plane. This is not a new instrument. It's been around since 1934, but nobody's really taken much advantage of it in the inorganic field until Gary started to push it. He built a Matog Herzog instrument. As you can see, it's compact is the word I'm looking for, a very compact instrument. 
you see the electrostatic analyzer and then the magnetic field and all the ions come through here in their trajectories and they focus on this focal plane here. Thank you.